morning, everybody. This is uh, Acts 2, 1 through 39, as interpreted by uh, Eugene Peterson from The Message. All right. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound, like a strong wind or a gale force, and no one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were blown away. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pomphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs were saying they're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused, what's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people are not drunk, as some of you have suspected. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen carefully to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you, the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well-thought-out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you. And you pinned him to a cross and killed him. But God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. David said it all. I saw God before me for all time. Nothing can shake me. He's right by my side. I'm glad from the inside out ecstatic. I've pitched my tent in the land of hope. I know he'll never dump me in Hades. I'll never even smell the stench of death. You've got my feet on the life path with your face shining, sun joy all around. Dear friends, let me be completely frank with you. Our ancestor David is dead and buried. His tomb is in plain sight today, but being also a prophet and knowing that God had solemnly sworn that a descendant of his would rule his kingdom, seeing far ahead, he talked of the resurrection of the Messiah. No trip to Hades, no stench of death. This Jesus God raised up, and every one of us is here as a witness to it. Then raised to the heights at the right hand of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out the spirit he had just received. That is what you see and hear. For David himself did not ascend to heaven, but he did say, God said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a stool for resting your feet. All Israel then know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made him master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Cut to the quick. Those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, so now what do we do? Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our Master God invites. This, this is, is the, the word, word of the Lord. Lord.
So each Sunday in April and May, we've been looking at one of the most uh, formidable famous figures in the Bible, St. Peter. And uh, we've been grappling with even that title, St. Peter, because Peter, for all of his strengths, for all of his high mark moments, he, he tripped and fell quite a bit. And yet, I think as we're looking at each of these segments of his life, we see, oh my goodness, I resemble him in so many ways. And, and if God can use someone like Peter, and boy, did he use him, as we'll see today, then he can use people like you and me. But you know, he had tripped and fallen many times and badly the last time, but then Jesus forgave him. After Jesus rose from the dead, he forgave him, and yet the gospel ends at that point, and it's sort of a cliffhanger. You're sort of like, okay, what, what is next for Peter? This is what's next. It's, it's the sequel. This is the beginning of the story of the church. In fact, this day, Pentecost, is really kind of the birthday for the church. Ten days earlier, Jesus split the scene. He ascended, and now a collection of his followers, about 120 of them, are in Jerusalem because it's a great festival called Pentecost, predated Christianity. People are there from all over the world, actually. And these gatherers of Jesus are together in a room when all of a sudden this wild wind comes down into the room. And then these tongues of fire descend and split apart and set upon each one of these followers of Christ. And they start speaking in foreign languages that they didn't know before that moment. Well, this caused a massive disturbance. People outside, large crowd of people thousands of people say, what in the world's going on here? We, we can't make sense of this. I mean, wait a minute. These, this group of largely uneducated Galileans, this is a little, probably a little bit snobbish, that speak Aramaic, they're, they're speaking in all of our languages. What the, they could not wrap their mind around it. And Peter seized the moment. And, you know, if you know the story of Peter, you're kind of going, oh, okay, gosh, Peter, <laughs> steady here. But Peter actually, he stands strong in this moment. He surprises. And he stood up to this very large crowd now and explained what was going on. And that, in effect, was Peter's first sermon. And because this is the birthday of the church, this is the de facto first sermon of Christianity, of the church era. You know, Jesus had said, Peter, I'm going to build my church through people like you I'm going to show how that looks. This sermon now by Peter shows us the first vision for that church. It, it gives us kind of the design specifications for it. And so what do we see? What do we see about what the church, I know a lot of you have been, you've had bad experiences with the church. You've, you've, you're kind of, uh, you're de-churched. Sometimes people refer to it. This shows the vision for what the church is originally designed to be. You see three things briefly. The reach of the church, the message of the church, and the heart of the church. The reach of the church. And you see this in so many ways. I want to think just of four very briefly. The raw numbers are pretty staggering. Again, at the beginning of Peter's sermon, 120 people considered themselves followers of Jesus. After the sermon, guess how many? 3,000. Now, by almost any metric, that is an extraordinarily successful sermon. But as a preacher who's prone to insecurity about others doing better than me, you know, the point is never about the person. It's about the spirit, especially on the day of Pentecost. The point is it's the spirit of God that has reached out of heaven into the lives of people from all across the world and brought them to faith. So just the expanse, the reach that way. Secondly, he preached to an incredibly international crowd, as you heard in the specs beautiful reading. There were people, he said in verse 5, from every nation under heaven. The most cosmopolitan gathering you could have imagined in that day. So there were Asians, there were Africans, there were Europeans, people from, of course, since this is the Middle East, people from the Middle East. An extraordinarily diverse group ethnically, racially. Third, when Peter spoke, out of all the texts that he could have chosen, he chose Joel chapter 2 from the Old Testament. In other words, the very first Christian sermon 
The text for that was from the prophet Joel and the passage. If we just see this as the starting point of what the church is supposed to be like, man, it is amazing at so many levels. I want you to notice, first of all, how egalitarian it is in terms of gender. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So there's no one's too young and there's no ageism here. But importantly, there's a level of the, the leveling of the playing field between men and women. The spirit evidently did not differentiate by gender when dispensing his gifts for the, the benefit of the church and the world. And then the fourth thing that I think is just staggering about the reach here of the Spirit is he says, even on my servants, and again, the egalitarian, my uh, young men, excuse me, even on my spirits, both men and women, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days, and they'll prophesy. I mean, this is saying even for those who have the least power, who are utterly without power, to these, to servants, I'm now going to reach and empower them. So Christianity by design, the church by design, the original blueprint of the church from its first day was radically inclusive. Do you see that? Stretching across all barriers that typically segment and separate. The God of all creation is saying in verse 17, quote, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Two things to take away from this before we move on. Though the vision of Peter was unbelievably staggering in its reach, the church, of course, has often not lived up to that dream. So much we could talk about here, but just think about Houston. Houston, statistically, is the most racially, ethnically diverse city in the country. Why is it that Sunday mornings are still the most segregated time of the week? We need to understand that. We need, we need to make it our, and at City Church, we want to make it our business to understand that to as much as possible be an approximation of this design and what you see when you get to the end of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 5, where, it's, where everybody in heaven is celebrating Jesus who shed his blood and purchased people from every tribe, tongue, and people group. It is that cosmopolitan worship service in heaven that this worship service is to approximate. And we need to make it our business. The other thing I think to just notice is how the church has tended to treat women, uh, particularly more conservative elements of the church. Have they treated them with this kind of egalitarian spirit? I don't think so. And for a long time, I didn't either. So shame on me. Recently, I think some very prominent voices have been speaking out about this, about misogynistic patterns within the church. And I commend the courage of those individuals, those women who have spoken out. And I think we need those voices. We need to add our voices to them. So for those of us who consider ourselves Christians, if we want to be, as Paul put it, in step with the Spirit, then we need to be actively working for this beautiful dream that Peter envisioned. Okay, the other thing, and this is the longest point. I, I know you hate it when I make the longest point the first one because you think it's going to go on forever. It won't. I'll land the plane eventually. The second thing that I just have to point out is that this reach is nothing other than the Spirit of God reaching out of heaven into all kinds of people. And so it just bears repeating what we've said so often here at City Church is that no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've experienced, this Spirit comes to you to reach down into your life. Now, some of you know that it, this passage was not just Peter's first sermon. It actually was my first sermon many eons ago. Almost, I didn't know Peter, but it was close. When I was 17 years old, I preached my first sermon from this very passage on the day of Pentecost. It was an Episcopal church. They were having a baccalaureate service for some odd reason. The priest invited me to deliver the sermon. I didn't know what I was doing, but this was my passage, and a funny thing happened on the way to delivering my first sermon. It was like 
It truly was, and this may just sound fantastical to you, but it truly was, as I look back, like the Spirit reached down out of heaven into me and said, Leo, wait a minute, these things are real. As I'm reading the Bible, you know, it was like the, one of those Harry Potter books that just comes alive. It was like the hand of God, the Spirit of God came out of the page and just grabbed hold of me and made it real. Jesus became real to me. And God, the Spirit of God works in, you know, like the wind blowing all over the place. There's no formula. However, often he works as we give ourselves to his word. As we just open the Bible and start reading, it's amazing how oftentimes, and it's certainly my experience, because I think it was on that birthday of the church, that Pentecost, that I sort of had my spiritual birth. So I know this reach, the reach of the church. The second thing is the message of the church all these people from different parts of the world speaking different languages, but now they understand, they're hearing Christians communicating the, Peter's truth, what he, can, what he brings uh, into real clarity, that same truth all these other people are speaking and hearing it in their foreign languages. What in the world is going on? Okay, there's a little backstory very quickly. Very first book of the Bible, Genesis 11 Everybody at that time spoke the same language, and they used their ingenuity to collaborate to build this giant tower. And as it turned out, it wasn't so they could get to heaven and, you know, bow down and honor God. It, it represented the, 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 their desire to get to heaven on their own, to, to do everlasting life without God, a very secular notion in the ancient world to make a name for themselves is what it actually says in Genesis 11, 4. So God came down and he disrupted their language. He confused their language. And that's where the word Babel comes from, the Tower of Babel, because people were talking. One minute they understand you, the next it's like, what's that person just babbling about? Tower of Babel. Fast forward to this moment, Pentecost. Don't you see what it is? It's a reversal of Babel. It's God taking all the different languages of the world, one of the things that segregates and segments us from one another, and gave us the common language of his truth, reversing all of that. And it's something really important to notice about the Christian gospel, the Christian message. It is not designed to be held to ourselves. The church is not to be this insular body. It is to be decidedly outward-facing, and going out of our way, not to speak in some kind of religious subculture jargon, but to make the ancient truth accessible to every modern context, because that's what was happening on Pentecost. And what was that message? The gospel? You may know the word gospel literally means good news, but good news is only really good news if you see it in the backdrop of bad news. Otherwise, it's like, eh, whatever. But there was bad news. There was sobering news that he talked about. Babel itself was a day of reckoning, a day of judgment. Humans had become self-absorbed in their ambition. It was all about them. And that same impulse ever since then, I think, has lived in each one of us. The spirit of Babel, you might say. And Peter's most sobering words that day had to do with Jesus' death. Just listen to this. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. So it wasn't a mistake. This is by God's design. Nevertheless, you, with the help of wicked people, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. It goes on to push it even further. If that wasn't offensive enough, Jesus, whom you crucified, verse 36. Now, it's possible that some of the crowd there had actually been there. Maybe someone in the crowd had participated, but it's not. That's unlikely, and it's really not Peter's point. The point is, you weren't, just like you and I weren't at Babel, but the spirit of Babel lives in us. We weren't at the cross, but we were there. We participated because it was our waywardness spiritually, our estrangement from God, our own ambition for self that nailed Jesus to the cross. That's the sobering news and when our hearts begin to speak that message to ourselves, then the gospel, the good news becomes, well, spectacular news. See, while Babel represented human selfish desire to reach God in their own terms, 
The gospel is God's gracious self-giving act to reach down out of heaven into our lives. At Babel, God came down in judgment, but with Jesus, he came down in love. He didn't raise up a tower so we could climb our way through our self-effort to God. He raised up his son on a cross, something we did not deserve, so that we might receive the gift of his Holy Spirit and new life in Christ. That's the reach and the message. Finally, the heart of the church. So Peter preaches this incredible first sermon. I mean, how do you top this ever, Peter? I don't know. But he preaches this sermon, and then what's the response? Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. I love this this wording has always meant a lot to me because it just is so descriptive. They were cut to the heart. Literally, the Greek word is stabbed. It's like the spirit stabbed their hearts or pierced them. You know, it's one thing to know that you've broken God's rules. It's an altogether different thing when you realize at a heart level, you've broken his heart. That fundamentally Christianity is not about rules. The Bible is not a code of conduct. It's a, it's, a, it's a love story. And when we give God the, the obstinate reaction that human beings tend to do and turn away from him, it's breaking his heart. But God instead gives to his is great. Because the point of Pentecost isn't to leave them languishing in guilt, but to lavish them in love and grace, and speak the common language of love, the, the real lingua franca. So when Ellen and I lived years ago in Philadelphia, we lived right off of Germantown Avenue. There, uh, next to our home, there was a French family, and Ellen loved to hear the mother of that family speak. Even if she was kind of having a meltdown moment, she had these three little boys, and she, she would run out of the house. They'd run out of the house trying to get in the street. And she would run after him, screaming, yelling. But it sounded beautiful. It sounded incredibly beautiful. What the gospel of Jesus Christ does is it takes the harsh language of judgment and translates it into the beauty of God's love and kindness to us. So what's left to do? He said, Peter... These people were saying, what do we do? We've been cut to the heart. What do we do? He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent means literally change of mind, but the ancients didn't segment the human being up into constituent parts. They saw the mind as the gateway to the entire being. It's saying they were cut to the heart. They were, they were cut to the heart so that they, in, in their entire being, might recognize their great need and be changed from the heart outward. And what does that leave them with? It leaves them with a new identity. That's what baptism is really talking about. It's, uh, it's, it's saying that the things, we were always looking for things to try to build our sense of, am I okay? It, it, but what, what this is saying is, you, you, you've got something now to wrestle those human insecurities to the mat because it's not about our accomplishments um, or, or about our ambition. It's not about our physical appearance or financial well-being. It's not about what people think about you. It's, it's that you belong to Jesus Christ. He purchased you with his lifeblood. And, and that begin, when that truth cuts to the heart, it begins to free us, see? We don't have to live for all those other things. Secondly, it's a new love. I mean, when the language of the gospel pierces our heart, to know that message, not just in some theoretical way, but as a love story that is really, I mean, you're reading a love story and you realize, oh my goodness, it's actually about me. This grand, great, perfect being loves me so much, he gave his life for me. St. Augustine said in the fifth century, Lord, you struck my heart with your word and I loved you. Of course, when you see his word, is that love story written to you? More than anything else, you just want to fall more deeply in love with him. And, and it means that that love now is ammunition to help you wrestle to the mat competing loves in your life. And finally, it's a new power. The promise 
talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is verse 39 is for you and your children and for all who are far off. I mean, there's that language again, far off, that, that reach, the expanse of this. And the gift, I mean, w- when we are cut to the heart and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit, I mean, this is just mind blowing. It is a miracle. The Holy Spirit actually comes to live inside of you. And, the, and some of the language used is that it takes up residence in you and he's never leaving, never going anywhere. And as he begins to do his work in your life, you realize you now have accessible to you at every moment a power, the greatest power in the universe. A power that unites people instead of divides and sends us out on mission to bring healing wherever there's divisions. That reaches across barriers, ethnic, economic, geographic, and brings that kind of unity giving to us a brand new vocabulary so that we, we can begin to speak in our words and ways the universal language of love. Look, that, that's a pretty cool vision, right? That is, that is what the church is designed to be. It is the original design specification for the church, and we've got a long way to go. But it's also what we're designed to be. When we receive the gift of the Spirit... When you come to faith in Jesus, you now have that power. Let that power be unleashed in you. That you will never be okay allowing there to be these barriers that divide you, divide the church from the very people that the Spirit has been sent to reach. And let that life-giving Spirit reach down deep in you and strike you and cut you to the heart And you'll realize that as he does that, he frees you to live the language of love. Closing the sermon just in time, pray with me. Lord, thank you for the gift you have given to us in Jesus. As we come to your table now, give us the grace feeding upon him that we might go out of here as your spirit-filled people bringing healing into a world desperately in need. In Jesus' name, amen.